Welcome everybody. It's May 3rd, back for another Node Operator Roundtable. Um, and as always, we will start with a update on the software development side of things. And I think we got some updates on CDT from Stephen. Yeah, that's right. Um, so we had been mentioning the last several weeks that we were anticipating a release of the first RC for CDT v4.0.0. Um, all signs are pointing towards likely getting that out the door today. Um, and one thing that I'll mention kind of in complement to that is that uh, I've mentioned this in the past as well, but we have a developers roundtable, which is a day after this every other week. Um, we had originally intended to do a demo of kind of like the featured tool set, which is Antler Proj in the previous meeting, uh, just due to some logistics and uh, personal things that came up for some of our teammates. Uh, we're going to seek to have that happen tomorrow. So it'll be hopefully fresh on the heels of that release where we'll be able to walk through um, an example project, simple things like getting set up, uh, dependency management, stuff like that. Um, so we anticipate that coming around. Again, if anyone needs an invite, you know who to reach out to. That'll be me. Um, outside of that, uh, we also anticipate uh, probably a patch release this week for Dune. Um, and then probably a more material formal release either the week after this one or the week to follow that. So um, that's kind of where we're tracking at uh, from the developer tool side of things. Thank you, Stephen. Any questions for Stephen? All right. Well, out of that, we can move on to the round table portion. I'll pass it over to Brian. All right. Thanks, Daniel. So uh, before we get started, I've, I've got two potential topics that we could discuss today, but and um, those are continuing on our new types discussion. Um, we we got through the first couple node types and um, sort of documented some configuration best practices from folks on the call in previous calls. Um, we have a number of other node types that we could we could make progress through. Um, another potential topic is reviewing the um, the initiatives that we are targeting as potential items for the Leap 5.0 release. Um, we wouldn't go into depth on those items, but more just kind of a real quick high level statement on uh, on what it is. Um, and and basically the idea there would be to get um, any feedback as to you know, yep, this is important to me, or it's not important to me, but I see why it's important, or why the heck are you doing this? Or, you know, uh, any additional thoughts on, like, um, what you would consider uh, su success criteria for those items. So those are two that I have in mind, but I also wanted to briefly open a sort of open floor to, to gather any other potential topics um, so if anybody, I'll, I'll just give about 60 seconds of silence here, probably less than that, 20 seconds of silence uh, here to see if anybody pipes up with any uh, any items they'd like to discuss instead. All right, it's looking like no. So in that case, um, let's do a quick vote for folks. If you have the ability to do a uh, reaction, just do like a thumbs up. So uh, if you would prefer to continue the node types discussion, please do a thumbs up reaction. All right. If you would prefer to do a review of the potential 5.0 initiatives. Most people are unopinionated. Luckily, uh, <laughs> Matthew Darwin and Daniel Keyes have an opinion here. Okay. So we will, um, we'll go ahead and, and walk through those um, at a high level. Oops. Let me make sure. All right. Here we go. All 
Excellent. Okay. So, um, you know, this is a this is a mix of items that are being uh, developed internally, items that are being developed through, um, you know, RFP grant initiatives, items that are sort of a combination of the two, you know, like uh, contributions being made um, by the NF on grant initiatives, et cetera. Uh, but this is this is also not a list of things that are definitely going to go in, nor is it intended to be an exhaustive list of everything that could go in. You know, there will likely be some uh, some small items that that pop up and um, and get added into this. That you know, issues, bug fixes, um, you know, small, very small. Um, items these are intended to be the the really big coarse grained things that uh that we are targeting as potential items for 5.0 so the first one here is uh instant finality um this one if i can get my want to get a better gallery view so that i can see if somebody pops onto the screen there we go okay so, you know, again, I'm going 10,000 foot view here. Uh, instant finality is uh, obvious. I think it's obvious by the name, but it's changes to um, core protocol in order to allow for near instant finality. Um, so in, instead of the, the current finality times, um, I, I can't remember what the target here is, but it's it's like second or or a couple seconds at most uh to reach finality this obviously has um you know far-reaching implications as far as like we what um the benefits that it can have mostly for uh developer applications that that would want to you know build on this because much quicker um uh the you know, ability to count on a, a piece, a transaction is actually being included in the blockchain and affecting state in the way that you expect it is or expect it to. So much snappier experiences, et cetera. Um, it does also, and we're not going to go into a whole lot of details here because, you know, we would end up only talking about one item. It does have some implications too about like um, the roles of um network participants uh, you know it's there's uh concepts of um obviously still block production then there's a, a concept of um transaction validation as like a um a separated concern um but uh yeah so so there are some sort of co like protocol level implications to this um but I guess, so my question here is first, are there any comments on this? And then, you know, second, you know, what's, what's the kind of level of interest in potentially diving deeper into this in, in a future topic with folks who have been, you know, closely involved in this initiative? Well, it's certainly interesting. Um, you mean from like a technical, I mean, I'll, I'll be interested to understand, uh, more of, uh, the use case. I mean, I know there's use case, right, but, uh, how this would, uh, affect people that are building and, mm -hmm. you know, other, other, uh, you know, things that have been held back with, uh, you know, what's it, three minutes or whatever. Just right. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely a great topic. Yeah, what's interesting about that one is I think I think uh, so. So at a, obviously, at a high level, the use case is relatively obvious in that it's really just like a speeds and feeds kind of thing, right? Like it makes it um, it makes it effectively faster if for transactions where you um, must be a hundred percent confident that it has been included in the blockchain, and you can't don't want to do like probabilistic type stuff, you know. Um, 
but I also think the, the, you know, you can get a little speculative about, you know, at a certain point, um, you could potentially just pretend that the moment you've submitted a transaction that it's definitely going to work or something like that. You know, um, I don't, anyway, um, I think that's stuff that we'd need to see in action, how, how developers actually change the way they build. How about level of interest of going deep into this? Um, because, you know, disclosure, this is this is a um an RFP project. And there has been obviously some some internal contributions. Uh some of our folks are working very closely in this. I'm not one of those people. <laughs> so uh, you know, the technical details I I I could not really go deep on. Um, but there are obviously folks both inside and outside the ENF that could potentially uh guest star here okay seeing one yeah well, I'm, I'm interested from a technical level as well how it's actually accomplished it's more like an academic thing on my side it's not going to affect my node operator um day to day but i, I it, it, they're just me yeah, yeah it's just pure curiosity really all right i uh i relate to the the academic interest because because i haven't myself been directly uh engaged in this one i um yeah i agree with you i have a academic interest in it too okay ram limitations um Next one here. And I, you know, I don't even know that I need to give a overview on this one. I think, I think folks know what I mean when I say RAM limitations. Uh, if you don't, let me know and I can give an overview. So any thoughts on this one? Level of importance? Any questions? Um, well, would love more to know what the plan is for that. Yeah, yeah. So I, I'm glad you asked that. Um, my best answer right now is I don't know. Um, <laughs> so we are we are we are working on like part. Of, these are the initiatives we want to tackle. Um, the definition of exactly what we're going to do to address it um, is still open, right? Um, being actively so so when you get to the point where you have got some proposal of what you plan to do then please share cool yeah so this sounds like one where you you would oops node operators potentially would be interested in a proposal review on this one well this one really impacts node operators so yeah especially node operators on certain blockchains which are very big or have a large number of accounts Yes, exactly. All right. Intercontract communication. Um, another potential title for this one was composable contracts. Um, this one's more so targeting developers than it is targeting node operators, or obviously end users don't necessarily care about these things, but um, this is just a... Um, a well-defined sort of first-class protocol feature for allowing uh, contracts to interact in a way that um, allows them to take advantage of the functionality of other contracts without introducing scaling concerns or security concerns or you know those sorts of things that could potentially prevent with this. So, like the goals are stay scalable and performant and also allow contracts to communicate in ways that allow for, um, uh, you know, neat things to happen <laughs> with, with regards to smart contract developments. I guess to quickly dogpile on that, um, 
there are of course other smart contract development patterns out in the wild that enable this and are much more uh, flexible so that you don't have to implement these super monolithic contracts. Um, Ethereum based contract development of course is, is a prime example of that wherein we have a lot more limitations for developers on our side presently. Yeah, thanks for jumping in, Stephen. All right, early start and broadcast for full blocks. We've talked about this one before. Just to kind of give a, a quick recap again, it is you know the ability to um, if you if you have already reached the like CPU budget, if you will, for a block, uh, don't don't wait around to broadcast it. Do that immediately, which um, we're, we're already doing that, but the part we're not doing is getting started on the next block. So rather than waiting and waiting to start pulling uh, transactions off of the sort of pending queue, uh, just immediately working on um, pulling that in. I say immediately, there there's a little bit of nuance to the, the timing of things, but um, the point is you, you don't wait for uh, the actual block slot, you do it, you do it earlier. Um, and so this way it's, uh, it, it's another feature to help minimize the odds of, um, to help minimizing the odds of having a last block that is not full while you still have pending transactions that you could have processed. Does that make sense? I think so. Okay. Any, yep. Is there questions on this? Well, good. Yes. I, I will just say on that one, the, that feature will make it harder to diagnose where there's problems between block producer latency because you don't know what when that block should have actually arrived. That's my only interesting comment with that. Not saying it's really a problem, but currently we have lots of charts that show, you know, how fast the block got to the, between different block producers because you know when it was supposed to be scheduled. Now you don't know. So you don't know how long it took to get there. So maybe, I don't know, there, there needs to be something in the block propagation or the block header that says, well, I actually produced it this time, even though it was scheduled at this time. And then you can compare that latency. Right. Otherwise, it's all good. Yeah, so potentially additional block header information would be helpful. Or something. Anyway, it, it just removes one of the diagnostic tools that we have to troubleshoot yeah. peer to peer connection issues between block groups. Yeah, that makes total sense. I think that's, that's an interesting <laughs> pattern because, in some ways, this is intended to help mitigate those issues but i do i see what you're saying yeah exactly so uh, maybe, maybe we don't have to talk about that anymore because it'll all be great however my uh network operations background tells me that that won't be the case <laughs> because there will always be some weird conditions that go on that you need to do troubleshooting and anyway, this just makes that harder so we'll have to come up with some other way of figuring out how well people are doing or whatever yeah it's like distributed uh Networked programming 101. Don't assume it'll work out the way you thought. No. <laughs> okay. if, if anything, it might make it worse because now the blocks are going to be bigger. They're going to be unpredictable. Maybe they don't even come in the right order anymore. You know, it, it, it could get a bit wonky. So, anyway, we'll see. Yeah. Um, Kevin, I'll follow up, follow up with you on this just to, to see if there's any... Uh... Well, I, I saw the wheels going. Yeah, I just brought this up. Yeah, but yeah, thanks for uh, giving some input there. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, block header is difficult because that's the consensus change, and you know, you'd be reluctant to to do that just for. Um, yeah, I realize that for the, for that feature. Now, you could wrap the block in a envelope on the PDP level. Uh, that'd be a new. PDP protocol, but that's a much less um, uh, scary thing than our, you know, proto uh, consensus change. So, 
potentially something there, although it might be, I mean, we already are doing heartbeats that measure latency. Um, I mean, that's, so we could just pay closer attention to that uh, feature that's already, that's already there. Um, it doesn't really tell you about individual blocks, but it would uh, inform you about latency between nodes. Oh, yeah, but it's only individual nodes that, you know, if it took three hops to get the block to get to you, that does not help. Right. Yeah. Okay. That's a good point. All right. Yeah. So maybe an envelope for the block or something. Okay. All right. Um, I've somehow managed to use that. There we go. Okay, cool. So next up is another, um, RFP item, peer node discovery improvements. Um, and again, this is, a uh, um, an example of, of something that's being worked as sort of a, a partnership between, um, external folks and ENF folks. Um, is there a question there? Yeah, uh, so, no, so, sorry, my... My brain skipped tracks there. Um, yeah, so so peer node discovery improvements, I think this has come up. In fact, I think, Ross, I think you in the sort of genie lamp discussion kind of had some peer node mm -hmm. discovery requests, right? So Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this uh, is a good one that applies to all of us. Okay. Any uh, thoughts or context or questions on this one? Yeah, I have a, a, when you get to actually implementing it, I have a bunch of questions about how, uh, you know, this is going to prevent people from, uh, or how do they appear to like private IP addresses? How does, uh, things get done with IPv6 blocks? So like there's protection today. Like if you only have, allow one peer to peer connection per IP address or two, you can set a limit, uh, which prevents you think from getting overloaded. But if you've got an IPv6 block, well, now you have a whole slash 64 worth of network addresses. So maybe it needs to be have a subnet mask. Uh, uh, yeah. Things like that. Uh, you know, because if you look in the <clears throat> Ethereum community or whatever, there's lots of discussion about peer to peer connections going to certain banned IP addresses, which then gets you blocked on Hetzner or whatever. So uh, there needs to be some thought into. It, you know, mitigations on which IP addresses are allowed and how that's controlled and things like that. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. I think, uh, so I've taken the action item here to, to follow up with, um, Steven and Jeff, this, since this is, uh, an RFP item on the best way to feed. So I think the Ethereum community has learned a lot in this area. So let's make sure we're not repeating the same mistake. Like that's why kind. All right. We've talked about this one before, generalized IP port configuration for Nodeus. Um, um, this one's kind of dual, um, dual origin, right? So uh, the request has come up several times in sort of the history of the software for the ability to have more configuration options and more, um, uh, what's the word, um, more separated, uh, configuration options, a uh, flexible, um, you know, ability to isolate these things. We went through the proposal on this on a, on a recent call, so I won't go into too much detail here. The other kind of origin of this is that we built a single purpose implementation of this for 4.0 for the, um, Prometheus plugin, um, and this is also sort of a, a technical debt uh, item for us to just uh, not have a uh, sort of redundant implementation of of um, of 
what's what am I trying to say of the of the server um, solution, um, which is which is how that single purpose solution works. So this is both addressing kind of a, a code based thing, and also providing you know requested functionality. All right, re reproducible pinned builds. Actually, I'm wondering if I could put uh, Steven Diesel on the spot to give a brief one on this. It's it's internal, so I don't know that he needs to give a whole lot of detail here. Uh, <laughs> what I mean by internal is we're kind of the customers of this one for the most part, I think. But Yeah, so I mean, th this is basically just simplifying the CI process to where we're no longer like manually generating the assets that we attach to releases. Um, so... That's the primary focus. Um, right now, it requires manual steps. And uh, as we are kind of maturing as a team in the means by which we deliver products, um, this is something that should be much better automated and reproducible. Yeah. The intentions of items like this, which you'll you'll see pop up in various releases, are they're kind of meta features in that they don't really provide a feature to stakeholders directly, but what they do is hopefully help us move much more quickly um, by by removing um, redundant manual steps. So. All right. Um, the, the eliminate related yeah. to that last one, I'd be interested to hear some feedback, if you don't mind, around um, the, the whole idea of pin builds and, and consistency and, and states. So, you know, the reproducible pin builds are, you know, when we do a release, we, we, uh, we use just what we call a pin build, which is a, a set configuration of compiler, boost version, um, and I guess OS, uh, maybe that's a given. So mainly boost and compiler version, um, and, and arguments to, to, to those so that you can restart a node simply by shutting it down and restarting it and the state file can be reused, right? So that's possible, for example, with the 4.0 release. If you were to grab our pin build, you know, the build that we provide, you can shut down a 3.2 node and start up a 4.0 node without doing anything else, just start and stop. Um, and so that's somewhat the, the purpose of, of the pin build is to provide that functionality over time, right? So. I recently asserted um, when, when talking internally about this topic that the importance of restart via state is not maybe what it used to be at, at what point in time. In early days, we took extra care to make sure that that was uh, doable as, as long and as uh, you know as as much as we could we could to make that happen. Uh, some of that in the early days was because that it also included the history plugin uh, data. You know, because you didn't want to have to recreate all that, which was also in that state file. Of course, that's that's no longer the case um, these days. And and I believe that these days, at least the, what I'm asserting, is that people are or more likely and and maybe more trained um, to just go ahead and restart with with uh, snapshots as opposed to restarting with with state file. Well, I'm wondering what are people's opinions on the um, you know, they, they, all the care that's taken into produce these reproducible, restartable nodes as opposed to just maybe every release, release saying, well, you know, start with snapshot. I think every, what do you call it, feature release to start with the snapshot is reasonable. If it's a patch release, that's a little inconvenient. So it was really nice. Like I was expecting to go from 3.2 to 4.0 to need a snapshot. And then I like the first time I did it, it's like, oh, it just upgrades. Awesome. Great. I saved this step. Right. So I think that's a reasonable expectation. But yeah, if I'm going to from 3.2.1 to 3.2.2, I don't want to use a snapshot. All right. So yeah, so certainly on, on patch releasing that, that makes perfect sense. And you also mentioned, you know, from like say a three dot X to a four dot X, uh, expecting a snapshot doesn't seem unreasonable. How yeah. about come out from like a three dot one to a three dot two? Would that be a reasonable um, use a snapshot upgrade? I don't know. It depends what you guys are doing with three point 
3.1s and 3.2s. In the past, there seemed to be a more use of that. Now it seems like you want to go from 4.0 to 5.0 to 6.0. So I don't know what you're doing with that minus the middle digit anymore. So, you know, you know, Kevin, it's always it's always <laughs> a little <laughs> it's a, it's always a little inconvenient. Um, but let's weigh it up with what like the where the effort is on your team. It if it's going to save you uh, uh, some time to focus on something more important, then hey, you know, we'll just deal with a snapshot. I mean, if you ask us what we want, we we never ever want to have to use a snapshot ever. You know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but we know at the same point that that's not realistic. There are going to be changes no, no, no. over time that require you to use a snapshot. And then, so I think Matthew, I, I agree with you. Right? You know, when there's a a marked step up, then the snapshot's no problem. You know, if I I, I often find them, um, I get caught out with uh, having it to use a snapshot if I compile myself or if I just use the deb. There's always some freaking mismatch. Um, with whatever it was compiled with originally. But I'm happy to use the snapshot if required. All right. Appreciate the feedback. Guys. Excellent. And now I just, you know, a quick sort of statement on on, you know, how we're look how we're looking at prioritization of items, because this is sort of the disclaimer of all oh, this could change, right? Um <laughs> so, you know, the uh what makes um, antelope, you know, sort of stand apart is really the you know, performance scalability and reliability. So of course, um, those sorts of features that, uh, enhance that and take it to the next step are always, um, you know, priority items. The thing that trumps those items are, uh, when we have opportunities, features or opportunities that will help us drive um, developer adoption and ultimately uh, end user adoption. So where those opportunities present themselves, um, other things might, you know, might come in and take uh, precedence over some of these things, uh, even causing some of these things to fall out. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of the high level framework is like, you know, end user adoption, develop then developer adoption, and then uh, performance scalability, reliability features. All right. Um, yeah. So this was, you know, obviously just a very high level overview. I appreciate the the feedback and commentary on on those items. If you have uh, a, additional, you know, questions or or anything that you want to go into, I'm always available on Telegram for discussions and, and also always welcoming of, um, you know, of, of scheduling a, a call to do a one-on-one -on -one if you want to really dive deep into something. Uh, on Telegram, I'm, I'm at B hazard. So pretty, pretty easy to find. Okay. So I guess then, uh, just. Staying on the, yeah, two Zs. Thanks, Stephen. At B H A Z Z A R D. Um, staying on 5.0 a little bit longer. You know, we, we also, I think our last call, we did sort of the, or maybe it was two calls ago, we did the quote unquote genie, uh, genie wishes, uh, conversation. Um, I'm curious about, you know, people's, you know, we've talked about individual items, people's overall thoughts on the items that we've, uh, reviewed, um, you know, if it, 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 are there things that you expected to see that you're not seeing? Are there things that you're seeing here that you're scratching your head? <laughs> like, why, why is that the focus? Um, you know, any of that kind of feedback. I think it's what I, what we originally discussed. Obviously, some of those lines were um, broad strokes, and we had like an hour sometimes talking about some of those things. So, uh, you know, when you just say uh, optimizations or improvements, I'm sorry, that obviously there's a whole lot of other layers. To that. But yeah, that's what we spoke about. Um, yeah, all good. 
this is probably less node operator relevant than it is developer relevant, but while it's on my mind and on the topic of like antelope superpowers that we could enhance, but what sets the antelope apart, um, something that I think we're underutilizing that maybe there's some low hanging fruit. I don't know exactly what it would be, but the flexible account permissions of antelope is something that I haven't seen on any other blockchain and <clears throat> they're very powerful if you know how to use them. The problem is most people don't know how to use them and don't know the potential for how, you know, op opportunities to use them effectively. Um, so don't know if that's a documentation issue or an SDK, you know, it's, it's probably not a protocol level thing, but tools that help people to configure accounts with more complex permission sets, multi-sigs, all that kind of fun stuff that right now you need to be an expert to be able to do that all manually. Um, oh. it would be great if there would, you know, especially with GameFi being a focus and things like that, I think there's maybe some opportunities there. Now, Aaron had uh, some requests for some features, like he wanted time delay on missions. Yeah. He, permissions that time out. Yep. Yeah, permissions that time out was, was his uh, request. Um, I actually did discuss that uh, internally and get some feedback. And I think the uh, people, um, they're, they're, some of the core sort of architects uh thoughts are already in that area um th their approach is a little different but to satisfy the same goal like around being able to um being able to support scoped temporary um that's the word i'm looking for um sort of granting of authority <laughs> right to to another uh entity so uh, where's the, the documentation? Is that docs.esnetwork.com? Is that the is that the the current documentation? I, I can see it's got the API references and stuff in here. Yeah, I, I I'd love to know what the doc strategy is there. Yeah, that's an important one. I mean, we just called it now. I mean, Daniel says, "Are we gonna are we gonna teach everybody to use the permission structure?" And I'm looking here and I can't find it anywhere. But it used to be in the old Docs like the SIO stuff. Yep. I think that's important. Like really important. Yeah, there's yeah. a lot of stuff missing there. Yeah, get give me more there. Like uh what what do you think are the most important things that um we need that we don't have in that in that area? Well from a from a user perspective, just pure user, you know, maybe we need some details on how to use um, how to use uh, kiosks and the permission structures and that kind of stuff. I just I haven't been here in a while. I usually come here to look for API stuff, mm -hmm. um, and I'm just it doesn't seem to have. It's got EOS EVM stuff in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that is they're missing like. Uh... Just jump in quickly, like uh, last time I was looking for just checking some parameters for, you know, compute transaction API, and it just doesn't exist, like on the docs. Like as far as I can tell, you, you know, you go to like, okay, version 3.2 or latest, but it actually link, links you to like some really old uh, docs for a very old version that doesn't include any of these uh, new items. And I think the only place is if you search for compute in the docs, you'll get linked to kind of a page that talks about Dune and the link to the actual code of compute. So, and also every time you search and click, it opens a new window. It's really not, honestly, this, this whole docs thing needs to be thought out uh, properly because currently it's, it's like, it's much easier to just use node eos dash dash help at this point, uh, which most developers, especially new developers are not going to do. Mm -hmm. So how about that? Are uh, you looking for wishlist for, for 5.0? Before we even get there, we need to, the documentation to be like comprehensive, um, the operate, the operate, operation of the protocol and all the programs that run in it. Yep. Just want to mention here that it would be really helpful for DevRel if we had, um, 
basically a list of things that you might be interested in um, or that would be helpful for you. Yeah, so that's a, an open call to make that a like really specific action is um, if you, the next time you go searching for documentation and uh, definitely if you don't find what you're looking for or even if you find it, but it's just hard for you to find, um, you can you can please let me know about it uh, again at B Hazard or um, you know if you if you're uh, uh, already connected with um, Nate uh, oh my gosh Nathan yes uh, <laughs> then um, please you know he he would also obviously be very interested in that as he heads up. Deb Realm, so, uh, which is developer relations if, if we are to work. So yeah, next time you're, you're cursing us because you can't find something, <laughs> curse us to our faces. <laughs> I think just simply having like an API reference, it should work like other, uh, you know, applications, documentations where by default you see the latest. You know, for example, in Node.js chain API, you always have at the top left what version that is for as a drop down that you can switch so you can easily see the changes. All those things are like kind of standard in the industry. And here it's, they're all linking to an old version. So like worse than not having the documentation is wrong documentation or incomplete documentation. So I think like just having that as a start will just for at least API reference, it's, it's a necessity. Yeah, related to that, I made a comment earlier, which uh, on an earlier, a few weeks ago or a week ago that, you know, it'd be great to see the documentation up to date as the uh, release candidates come out. But I was told, well, we don't want to link those two things because those are separate processes. But, well, but if I'm testing RC4 or RC3, then where am I finding the documentation for that? So, uh, yeah, I think the way I captured your feedback, um, just to make sure everyone understood it correctly, is like we, you know, we're for sort of minor and patch releases, um, it, you know, it might make sense to um, rely on like the built in CLI documentation being up to date. Um, but then for major releases, ideally, uh, documentation is launched in sync with that right yeah the the other thing that i've seen <clears throat> some other projects did it i'm not this is the best practice or not is that they have a ongoing release notes mm -hmm. markdown file so as new features are added to the release the release notes are built incrementally so as part of the pr getting a pr approved well you have to write the release note blog yeah. right so therefore if i'm looking at the 5.0 and i want to know what's new and how to use it well, the release notes are being built as it goes. Yeah, so we, we actually uh, plan to do exactly that for like internally. Um, we hadn't really talked about specifically like going ahead and making that uh, public, but I think that's that I don't see why we couldn't do that. Um, I mean, obviously, it's not the final polished form. It will right. be some, you know, wordsmithing when it gets to the end, but at least you have the list of all the major features. And then when you go to do the 5.0 release, well, you don't forget what was done six months ago. Right. Because hopefully it was added at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we want to do that uh, internally just as a process improvement because, you know, the making the release notes at the end takes uh, like a whole day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, I know the challenges. You know, I used to run an R&D team with, you know, several dozens of people in it. And building the release notes at the end of the release. Uh, yeah, that was a challenge. Yep. And it was more than, it took more than a day, I tell you, in our team. <laughs> also, ideally, if the docs could have, especially the API reference, or maybe the API reference could have some type of like swagger like uh, ability where you can actually test it on the, on, on the page itself. So you can, you know, test like get info or get block or whatever other API, especially for new developers. They want to see it right there in the page, what to expect, 
before, you know, just running it themselves. Even if they have to input their own API endpoint. Yeah, and I think there's already a swagger thing somewhere in the background there anyway. Or I have seen such a thing in the past. So that would be cool. The other thing, you know, speaking of that swagger thing, maybe it should just ship as part of Node EOS or something so that the standard, when you go to a block producer's API page, there's already a swagger page there. Mm -hmm. Like uh, Hyperion does that, for example. Right? Every Hyperion has a swagger page. Yeah. Um, I was just looking at the old one. It's pretty, it's a lot more comprehensive, even though it's built 2.1 and or whatever. I mean, it has some accounts and permissions. Uh, uh, the, the new one has accounts and permissions, but I just found that it's under resources. Okay. Uh, post, uh, that was not obvious, but I was clicking around since we talked about it. I was like, oh, there's accounts and permissions. Resources. What section is it under? Oh, there you go. Okay. Oh, okay. Well, that's not very uh, intuitive. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> uh, and it's the same. It's the same picture. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But it's it's just there. Um, okay. okay. All right. Maybe that's off the bottom. Funny stuff. Well, maybe it just needs some uh, usability. You know, take some users, give them those challenges, find X, and then see how long it takes them to do. You know, those kind of tasks that you would do in a usability study. Right, because the goal is within you know whatever two clicks you can find the the thing you're looking for. Yeah, so you know clearly Ross and I were not looking under resources for account <laughs> management. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. It's, it's yeah, and redo the whole the doc. The ES protocol the doc just maybe start up a layer or something. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we, we've, we've kind of talked about documentation. Are there other things like this that, that, um, strike you as obvious that, you know, need, need to be, uh, need to get focused? Sure, we'll think of things as we go. Well, there's a wish list for the item I asked about before, which is like to extract data from a snapshot file. I played with the leap util ability to do that, that uh, Kevin uh, pointed me to. Kind of the issue with that is like, first, it needs to load that snapshot into Node EOS. It's not actually, you know, uh, dealing with a file, it's running like another chain. Uh, in your temp folder to so say you do this for wax you're you know first of all it needs to allocate this 87 gigs for the state file and uh, then produce a json that is also like gonna end up being like 60 plus gigabytes and there's no filtration option there, there's really nothing when you're running deep util um, and in addition to that the, the output format is even though like you can programmatically read it you still need to programmatically almost stream it. You can't just read that into memory uh, for most computers. And the output is just like the structure is for me, just not really usable. Like, uh, you know, like you have all the contacts all into one kind of array, like the whole structure of it is not very usable. I was wondering if there is any plan or effort to work on a leap util snapshot, um, you know, extraction utility that does not need Node EOS itself, ideally, but if it does, a way for you to pass on parameters like uh, an array of contract names or like a CSV of contract names, that way it only extracts the data relevant to that. That would be like super useful. Currently, I'm back to using Diffuse for that. Can you give me um, some clarity on, on the specific use case you're trying to solve with this? Oh yeah, like say I want to, for example, do like an airdrop to uh, at a certain you know block height. So uh, currently I don't have any, and I need to get like a bunch of different tables from a bunch of different uh, accounts. 
Now the only way is to use either like the snapshot file, right, with your leap util and output everything because I need to guarantee it's at that specific block height and not, you know, like changed while I'm fetching the, the table rows. So either I use leap util or I, you know, load from snapshot and then just don't, don't continue appearing, don't sync that node and just keep, you know, uh, like stop at a certain block and just, you know, get table rows. Uh, as much as you need without syncing that node, which is obviously just not a good way to do it. Or currently what I'm doing, which is just diffuse. Diffuse allows you to get the state at any block height and the scopes and everything else. And on top of the leap util output is like, you still need to do some work on the values. It's not coming to you and kind of like, you know, deserialized clean data. So might not be a priority thing, but um, yes, yeah, it's, it's quite annoying to, to get around. I think the use case makes sense. Um, what I'm curious about now, so you you mentioned two two potential solutions. What is it about those two solutions that is uh, undesirable? So you said so you could load everything into a node with no peers, or you can use diffuse. Diffuse is great. So uh, you know, like that's what I do now. Like just wrote a small whatever file, uh, Node.js, that would just you know get you all the scopes. Uh, get the contract, get the ABI, figure out all the tables, get all the table names and per table, get all the scopes and things of the sort. And that way you can extract all the info. And that's great. But, you know, running like a full diffuse for WAX is not something that the average user can do. It would be much nicer if you can just get the snapshot file and you don't need anything else, which was what the diffuse and migrate tool used to do for older versions of Node EOS. You, be, uh, you basically just give it a snapshot file and what it will do is it will just output this big hierarchy into like a, a folder where it will be like a, 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 B, like like some type of like predictable uh, hierarchy and then you can kind of go down to exactly what you need and it just runs locally, you know, no need to load into node EOS and the output is, you know, small because it's divided in using that hierarchy. So each file you need, you can grab like right away. Thank you for explaining that. My pleasure. Excellent. We are about at time. Um, so I appreciate everyone's feedback um, and I'll hand it back to Daniel. Well, thank you very much, Brian. Uh, and thank you everybody for participating, sharing your feedback. We'll uh, wrap it up for today and see you all in, in a week. Have a good day, everybody. Cheers, everyone.